Let's take a look at uh, from 1750 to 1814, images 99 through 107. We'll look at neoclassical and then Goya, and we'll stop right before Romanticism. Okay, 1600s background is the Scientific Revolution, 1700s is Enlightenment. And re remember, the Enlightenment is about learning and progress and reason. So, our first image is number 99. It's portrait of, I call it portrait of Juana. And this one is famous for, first of all, it's a female portrait, which is rare. She was very prominent, and we're in the Enlightenment now, so notice the books and the learning. And I believe she had to choose between the church and a life of learning and being an intellectual, and she chose the intellectual life. She's a very, there was not a lot of girl power in 1750. She's a very prominent female, and this is showing um, that enlightenment of uh, emphasis on learning. Also, you want to be making comparisons, think about other prominent females like Hatshepsut and others we've seen earlier. All right, number 100 is philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery, and this is really also about learning and about the Enlightenment. Um, now, we want to start thinking about, you know, what's the function of the work? What's the idea the work's trying to convey? What's the artist trying to do? This one, it seems to be conveying the idea of the Enlightenment. So just real quick, remember the Enlightenment is about understanding the world. And so Newton discovers the physical laws of gravity and explains physical laws. And then John Locke talks about natural laws and maybe there's natural rights. And so the Enlightenment is really this idea that if you put your mind to it, you can create progress. You can improve the world. So this painting really captures progress and learning quite well. He's taking notes. Um, every, the kids are watching, uh, we've got books back here, and we have the light. And here, the use of light almost reminds us of Caravaggio. In Caravaggio's light, that tenebrism represented God, and here he's taking the light, and it's representing learning. So this is a, a celebration of the Enlightenment uh, with philosopher at the orrery. Now we're going to shift to what they call the Rococo. And the Rococo, you remember the swing, is um, about the aristocracy. And so this is a painting uh, about the aristocracy. And uh, some people say it as about love and a beautiful painting about love. Others hate it as, you know, obnoxious white privilege. But the swing is definitely about the Rococo, and it's about the aristocracy. And we're going into the 1700s now, so we're going to head into some, to some revolutions. But this is the aristocracy of France, the swing. And, you know... Baroque was very serious and religious. The swing is frivolous and pretty and fun and is really about aristocrats having fun. Uh, the next image is called Self-Portrait 105 by Elizabeth Lebron. She was a very famous and prominent artist. She painted Marie Antoinette, the queen that got her head cut off. So this is um, a painting about a very prominent woman. It's a self-portrait. It's about herself. And notice she's very down-to-earth and very um, approachable. She does not have the, uh, the airs of the uh, Rococo. And she also was connected with the monarchs. So politically, she was in trouble during the French Revolution. But for this one here, we have a very prominent artist, another woman of influence. She was very successful. And uh, that's Elizabeth Verbon's self portrait. All right, now we're going to shift to the revolution, the American Revolution, and bring the neoclassical. Neoclassical means the new classical, and you can see it in Monticello 102. This is Thomas Jefferson's house, and it looks classical. All right, so what is Jefferson doing? He's using classical architecture. Why is he doing it? Because he's, he's all about the American Revolution new democracy, a new republic. So when he uses classical architecture, he's making a statement about democracy, and he's going back to the Romans and the Greeks. And yes, that 76 is from 1776. So neoclassical will look Roman, dome, columns, dome, columns, also a Greek 
with the symmetry and the columns and the geometry, and that's going to be the new classical, the neoclassical. Staying with the neoclassical, we have George Washington. Houdon is a very famous artist, and this is a, a sculpture celebrating George Washington, and yes, it looks classical. Why classical? Greek, Roman, democracy. He's got contraposta, he's naturalistic, but he's also a man, not a king. So he's not the pharaoh, he's just George Washington. He's got his plow because he's a farmer, his sword, but he doesn't touch it. The 13 rods are like the 13 states, and that reminds us of like 13 arrows, 13 olives, the 13 colonies, e pluribus unum from many one, and this celebrates George Washington, who quite simply didn't want to be king, he just would be president to serve and then go back to his farm. And this is very different from the European idea of the, imagine, compare him to the Sun King Louis, which about the same time. Very, very different view of power here. This is the American president, the citizen who will serve his country and then go back to his farm. All right, then uh, well now we go to the French Revolution and we have um, a painting called Oath of Horatio and this is neo, again, neoclassical painting. Okay, Oath of Horatio looks like a Roman story. Roman columns, Roman arches, Roman clothing, contraposta, and in this painting they are doing an oath to fight for their country, to fight for Rome. In this story, these men will fight for their country, but their wives are from the other country. So this is really about sacrifice. They'll fight for their country, but their family is going to suffer. But the subtext of this is the French Revolution. The French Revolution has not happened yet, but it is in the air. So this is also about sacrifice for the revolution, the French Revolution. On painting here, well, this will become more clear later, but on the form, this is called like line or hard line, clarity. It's very ideal, very, and, it, and, and it's perfectly naturalistic. That's neoclassical form. All right, then the French will have several revolutions, as we'll see all the way up through 1830, but this is the first one of the first French Revolution. All right. Now we're going to, and that's neoclassical. Then in the 1800s, we'll have romanticism and realism. We're not there yet. But in the early 1800s, there's an artist named Goya. Let's just call it Goya. We won't categorize him. He's going to be in his own league, and he does disasters of war. This is famous for being an anti-war painting. 3rd of May was his first painting, and it, was, and it showed the war crime. And this also is about war crime and the disasters of war. Why is this important or significant? It's the first anti-war work we've ever seen. And he shows the brutality of the war and the horror of the war. And, remember, and if you compare, look at the view of war here and the view of war here. And furthermore, he was a Spaniard. And when the French came into the French Revolution, they were supposed to bring liberty and equality. He saw them butcher and murder civilians with war crimes. So, big idea here, anti-war. He presents the horror of war that is Goya. There's a second image called Grand Odalisque 107. This doesn't really fit any categories either, so let's just look at this. This is about beauty. And we've seen other paintings like this before about beauty. And the artist here is Angre. He studied with David. David did this one here, and you can see they have this, uh, the same style. And this style is like, they call this the academic style of the salon. And the salon is where they show the paintings and has certain rules like clarity and a finished look and clean lines. This would be the art of the salon. So um, it's one of the last ones we'll see of the salon because art's going to change dramatically. The other thing about this one is it's it's a little bit, um, it, got into, it got criticized for being Eurocentric because this is a woman from a Turkish harem, and it's kind of glamorizing being in a harem. It's almost like a European fantasy of the harem. So, But basically, it's about beauty. We can't quite categorize it. It's going to be one of the last of the academic paintings that we will see. All right, that'll take us to Romanticism, but let's cover that in the next video of the 1800s.